What's up, people? I'm Erica. And I'm Hillary. And this is Cocktails and Capitalism. Today we're drinking the Dark and Stormy, which is made of one and a half ounces of ginger syrup, which I had left over from a prior episode, half ounce of lime juice, uh, plus a lime wedge, five ounces of seltzer, chilled, and two ounces of black rum, which I poured over a spoon, the back of a spoon, to kind of get it to kind of settle on the top above the lime and the seltzer and, and ginger syrup. And it is pretty delightful. It looks lovely. It tastes lovely. I'm about it. It's really nice. <laughs> nice. <laughs> yeah. And I, I chose the Dark and Stormy because um, I think it kind of captures the vibe of the topic. I chose to write about homelessness in America during COVID. Oh, man. Oh, man. Oh, man. <laughs> yeah. I just feel like it's so crucial right now to talk about this. Absolutely. Yeah. So many people are on the edge of being kicked out of their homes. So yeah. many people are just living on the edge of life in general. So mm -hmm. uh, I'm just going to dive right in. Please do. In the 1930s, Dorothea Lange traveled the country photographing migrant workers who were escaping the Dust Bowl in search of employment. She was w working for a New Deal agency called the Resettlement Administration, which relocated poor, starving individuals into government-planned communities. At this point in time, police were actually stationed at the California border to stop the jobless poor from pouring into the state in search of work. Driving back to her home in Berkeley, Dorothea felt she had enough photographic evidence of the suffering of America's poor, and she reflected on that fact as she drove past a sign stating Pea Pickers Camp in Nipomo, California. Miles later, she couldn't shake the urge to turn around and pay a visit to the camp. When she did, she encountered a woman and her three young children wearing dirty rags and living in a tent. Speaking with the 32-year-old Florence Owens Thompson, Dorothea learned that the woman and her children had been surviving on frozen vegetables from the field and the birds that the children had managed to kill. Yeah. I think we're two minutes and 54 <laughs> seconds in and I'm already fucking crying. Oh, I'm sorry, Faye. <laughs> it gets a little, I mean, it's all pretty tough, but it's, that's, a, that's probably the saddest of the facts, I think. <laughs> Okay, so, let's you go. Can, I, I know you can do it. <laughs> Mwah, I love you. Yeah, sure. <laughs> I do. I, 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 do. I, love I love torturing you, you now. <laughs> yeah, I kinda, I'm feeling like this podcast is like a torture device. <laughs> I'm just kidding. It is, you know? It kind of I is. <laughs> <laughs> the reality of the world is kind of torturous when you look at some of the things so yeah definitely it's tough in america as a homeless person so there's definitely some rough stuff so i hope yeah, it's not too sure too dark but. no i mean just because these struggles are out there doesn't mean that we ignore them so let's go fuck yeah so the photographs dorothea snapped while visiting with florence would send ripple effects across the entire country one image of the beautiful mother and her shy daughters ran in the San Francisco news, and the response was huge. Is that that super iconic image that mm -hmm. I'm thinking of? Yeah, I that image, it struck me so hard when I first saw it. And it's one of those images that just sticks with you for a lifetime. Yeah, absolutely. And I didn't really know the story behind it. I had seen it so many times. The mm -hmm woman with like yeah she's kind of a little bit dirty but she's got her kids kind of shyly huddled around her and she's yeah she has her hands up to her mouth she's looking up in the distance it's just like this yeah totally iconic striking yes. yeah i mean listeners if you are thinking i wonder if it's this image likely it is yeah but, yeah you, know, you can easily google it and you know check it out absolutely and it really depicts you know every all of the the troubling parts and the you know the really difficult parts of homelessness yeah, definitely. So the public sent letters and donations to the poor, and the government delivered 20,000 pounds of food to the migrant camp. Oh. Yeah. But unfortunately, Florence and her family had already moved on. It wasn't until decades later that more was discovered about the woman and her family in the photos, including her name and the fact that she was a descendant of the Cherokee people. Nevertheless, Florence left a legacy as the photograph of her family had dramatically increased public support for the New Deal programs that would slowly develop into the social safety net we see today. 
Hey, it's our podcast puppers. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Hi, puppers. <laughs> Hi, puppers. <laughs> the cayenne. <laughs> no, I think that was Robbie, honey. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, I don't even know where I'm end. hearing things. <laughs> <laughs> that was not on my end. <laughs> Crazy. Yeah, we love our dogs. <laughs> <laughs> dogs are the best. Dogs are the best. Way better than people. <laughs> totally. In response to the rising support for public programs for the poor in the wake of the Great Depression, federal surplus commodity programs were created to provide leftover food to impoverished families and individuals. Sadly, the food they provided was very starchy and lacking in nutrition. Yeah. It wasn't until the 60s that food stamps were implemented in various regions, but these remained unattainable for the poorest in America who lacked the money required to buy them each month. Until 1977, the poor were actually expected to purchase their own goddamn food stamps. It's insane. Yeah, isn't that so dumb? It's like, what is the point then? Yeah, what is the point? I'm sorry. That's... Yeah, a policy that just undermines itself. Yeah, definitely. Um, so fast forward to 2018. At this point, homelessness across the nation had actually declined 15% to 554,000 people after rising steeply to about 700,000 during the financial crisis of 2007 to 2008. Yeah. Oh, my God. Which was a shit show. And it we're... was horrible. Yeah. I don't know a single soul that wasn't affected yeah. by that. And things are, like, worse now than they were then. <laughs> yeah. As far yeah. as the economy goes. People losing their jobs at a much faster yeah. rate. And at, a, and at an unpredictable rate, too, which is really kind yeah. of scary. And people are just, like, at their last dollar. Yeah. So while the number of homeless people in most parts of the country had continued to decline between 2016 and 2019, homeless populations in California were exploding in response to the rising cost of living. This upward trend in California and a couple other states actually offset the declines in homelessness that continued across the rest of the country until very recently. We live in a state that has it bad. <laughs> yeah, real definitely. bad. And it's not getting any better either. No, no, not with this no. shithead in office. <laughs> yeah, totally. In 2018, a UN special rapporteur, I think is how you say it. Repertoire. Repertoire. I think. <laughs> I think. <laughs> <laughs> on extreme poverty and human rights, followed in the footsteps of Dorothea Lange by embarking on an American tour to document the horrific poverty that existed in the richest country on earth. Philip Alston traveled down to Skid Row in Los Angeles, where he, he observed some of the worst third world style, and that's in quotes, poverty mm -hmm. he had ever witnessed in his travels around the planet. <laughs> in Los Angeles, where like anyone who has never been there like has this wild image of Los Angeles, which is like so pristine yeah. and perfect and like palm trees and rich people and handbags and totally. bullshit and whatever. <laughs> it's like, no, fucking third world poverty, guys. Yeah, that's, that's where you go to make it, you know? <laughs> yeah, right? It's where you got to be really, really poor and not mm -hmm. able to afford any kind of Yeah, housing. jump on the struggle bus. Yeah. Enjoy. <laughs> struggle bus is very appropriate. <laughs> yeah. Beep, beep. <laughs> okay, so the abject squalor of the Skid Row encampments was shocking to Alston, who observed that toilet access in the area was actually worse than what he had found in UN-run Syrian refugee camps. Oh, my God. The nearly 2,000 homeless individuals here had access to only nine toilets. This means that many were using buckets or had to relieve themselves directly onto the street. Oh, my God. Yeah. Which is just Oof. so dehumanizing to be forced yeah. to do that and have no place to go and have all the shops closed so you can't go in and just tidy up and use a sink and running water. Right. Because uh, it's just it's shit devastating. show. So Steve Richardson, an activist with the LA Community Action Network, points out that the majority of the people with homes who dwell on Skid Row are black, like himself. Speaking to an interviewer from PBS, Steve offered some illuminating remarks. America paints itself as a good Samaritan country. I'm glad the UN came here because you see third world conditions right here, you know, in the richest country in the world that's worse than any other countries. When asked about possible solutions for reducing homelessness, Steve states that the solution is simple. Give people homes that allow them to regain stable footing in society. Mm -hmm. The solution is in the name homeless, <laughs> you know. Yeah, it's definitely. Right there. Definitely. Fast forward to 2020. Israel Rodriguez Sr. is a father living in Houston, Texas. When a CNN reporter arrives at his home, Israel's small boys... One four-year-old and the other, only 20 months, hide shyly behind the railing in their apartment. 
There is a knock at the door, which Israel opens to find a constable who orders the family to vacate the premises. Oh, my God. Yeah. Israel replies, telling the constable, we ain't got nowhere to go. Having already received warnings from his apartment manager and the county court, Rodriguez has no recourse left. With his baby in one arm while pushing a stroller stuffed with clothes and snacks, all that he can carry away, he stands outside his prior home. Forced to leave the rest of his family's belongings behind since he has no car or place to store possessions, Israel speaks to the reporter about all that he is forced to leave behind, stating that, quote, it's trash now. His voice breaks as he says, it's my fault because I'm supposed to be the man of the house. We ain't got nowhere to go right now. It was a lot going on there with the corona. When it hit, I lost my job. Oh, my God. Yeah. He pulled out a check for $361 out of his pocket, which was the only money left to his name. And he explains that even after he lost his job, he managed to find a little bit of work. And so he tucks the check away, telling the reporter that he's saving the money for the next apartment. Israel and his sons walk away from their home. And as he does this, he carries a flyer from the constable listing homeless shelters in the area. 27-year-old Donnie had already been homeless for two whole years when the pandemic reached America. Oh, my gosh. While working hard as a cashier at a hardware store and as a driver for two companies in Northern California, Donnie had nowhere to rest, nowhere to shower, and nowhere to call his own at the end of the day. In his own words, quote, I was homeless for almost two years, and I was working full-time trying to get off the streets. Jesus. Yeah. You don't, you don't really think about homeless people working so much. No, I don't. In spite of his hard work and determination, Donnie was forced to live in shelters and homeless encampments. Then the pandemic hit, causing many shelters to limit their intake numbers in an effort to enforce social distancing. As a result, Donnie was turned away from the local shelter and left out in the cold. He explains that, quote, it's hard to hold down a job being homeless and try to maintain the look of not being homeless and not knowing where your next meal is coming from and where you're going to stay the next night. After hearing Donnie's story, I reached out to him and was able to talk with him about his experiences. Wow. Yeah, I was so, so happy that he responded when I reached out to him. Yeah, that's and wild. Oh, my goodness. He understood how important his story is to people right now. You know, I I'm, I was just so touched that he was, he was willing to talk about it and yeah. kind of yeah. make himself vulnerable like that. I know, that's really great. So this is a quote from him. It's super hard to work and be homeless. Everything I owned was in a backpack that I had no choice but to take to work. I was struggling with mental health issues, and I tried many times to save and get off the streets and out of the homeless shelter. But I was having trouble mentally and emotionally, and I felt like the streets had a hold of me. When COVID-19 hit and the homeless shelter would not let you in to stay the night, it hit me hard. I was staying in a hotel, and my money would run out, and then I would camp. Being in Humboldt County, California, where homelessness, homeless on homeless crimes are bad, I didn't feel safe as a 27-year-old. Still, I didn't give up and found out the Arcata Partnership and the city of Arcata had turned two parking lots into emergency sheltering for the homeless and provided you with a tent and sleeping bag. I went there and got a spot and a tent, then got a job in Arcata. By my second paycheck, I was on Craigslist looking for rooms for rent and didn't have much luck, but I didn't give up. I sent a lot of emails to people who never answered me, but I didn't give up. I did a Zoom interview with my current roommate, and an hour later I was told they would like me to move in with them. It took three weeks to find out I was approved, and I was still looking just in case. So he fucking made it off the streets. I'm so happy for him. (laughs) You sound real happy. (laughs) My lack of response is because I'm fighting some pretty severe tears, guys. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, this is a rough one. Yeah. But I'm so fucking proud of him. Yeah, I'm so fucking proud of him too. I had no idea that so many, so many goddamn people are living like that. Living out of cars, living out of tents, and clocking in and working long days. That's exhausting. Yeah. Oh my god, that takes somebody who is tough as nails. Mm Mm-hmm. And the number of times he said, I didn't give up. There's so many things that would have made me say, fuck this world, fuck these people, fuck getting yeah. a job, you know, I'm I'm just not even going to try. He is a strength, man. He's a hero of mine, you know, I just, I don't know how I could possibly make it through what he made it through and no. keep going. And he's going to tune in on Friday when we re- release this, so. <laughs> <laughs> so 
I'm stoked. Hi, Donnie. <laughs> What's up, Donnie? <laughs> I'm fucking proud of you, Donnie. Yeah, so fucking proud of you. I don't think I could have done it. No. Really. So experts estimate that between 25% and 50% of homeless individuals in America are actually employed. Holy cow. Isn't that fucked up? That's insane. Yeah. Your immediate thought is like, oh, they don't have a job. They're, they're down on their luck. You yeah. Know? Nope. They're probably working more hours than you are. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> probably working more jobs. You've got two jobs. He's got three. You've yeah. Got three jobs. He's got four. So. Totally. <laughs> Jesus. At the same time, I was, re- I was reading this, I was reading about like the change in the, the income disparity in the country and how uh-huh. after the New Deal, there was this like golden age until like the mid 70s where the disparity between the highest income and the lowest income was not that much. And so there was a really strong middle class. Uh-huh. And then starting in the 70s, a lot of that switched because all of a sudden executives, CEOs, they started collecting all of that money, all of the all of the profits started going to the 1% and not even the 1%, the like 0.01%. Right. Um, so even the people that are at the 95th percentile are making way less than they would. Have. So like people that are in the top rungs of society, they're making less than they would have if income inequality hadn't right, right. grown so much. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. they're poor compared to what they would have been. The 95th percentile is poor because it's all going to that tiny, tiny fraction. Right. So, right. The gap just gets wider and wider and wider. Uh huh. And cost of living keeps going up, and mm-hmm. you know, minimum right. wage doesn't change. So, yeah, but we have senators to this day against raising the minimum wage. It's like, okay, cool. You keep cool. sitting in your fucking ivory towers and gorgeous homes and mm-hmm. and operating that way. Go for it. And telling people they can't have more in life or hope for more in life. Yeah. And that it will, oh, jobs will go overseas if we raise the minimum wage. Okay, well, but people will die if you don't. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah, totally. So if these figures that I listed, between 25 and 50% of homeless are actually employed, if this is shocking to you, it's probably because we're so used to hearing that the homeless people in this country are lazy. But as the pandemic rages across the country, so many individuals wake up in their cars, in tents, or under bridges before heading off to work. These people typically work in low-wage, essential jobs in environments where the risk of catching and spreading the virus is extremely high. I've read story after story about hardworking Americans who are holding down at least one job, and often two or three, like you said, (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) while unable to pay for a place to call their own. 47-year-old Tiffany Cordaway was living out of a friend's car while working two jobs when the pandemic hit. Caring for an elderly couple at night, she spends her days disinfecting medical equipment that was used by patients who are sick with COVID. Oh, Jesus. Yeah, I would, I do not envy her. God. Still, she is unable to shower and decontaminate after finishing a shift. Oh, my God. She often uses a two-liter bottle of water to take a shower, quote-unquote, and because she lacks a washing machine, she sprays her clothes with disinfectants to minimize the risk of transmission. In an interview, she recently stated that this is a two-income world, and I'm only one person. Yeah. Just like you were saying. Jeez Louise. The hardest thing is, like, she's not even living in her own car. She's living in her friend's car. Like, yeah, yeah. She she doesn't even have that space. Just doesn't even have that tiny little space. Like, I mean, not that that's, like, you know, that would be any better, right? Like, she absolutely shouldn't have to live in her own car. But, like, Lord, you know? This completely refutes all of those assholes out there who are like, those homeless people need to get a job and they need to do better mm-hmm. for themselves. And yeah, you can do it. You can pull yourself up by your bootstraps and you make it in this world. And it just takes initiative. Like, yeah. okay, well, if you're working all day, night and day, and you can't afford a place, what do you say to those people? You know, yeah, right? <laughs> Fuck you. <laughs> yeah. So. What would you suggest that they do then? <laughs> Come yeah. on, guys. Yeah, like... Okay. I'm like, oh, well, they can you know, they can just get a better job. Um, okay. Yeah. How are they supposed to do that? Yeah. What job is available to them? One of the main problems that we face in addressing this humanitarian crisis in America is that data collection efforts have been suppressed. In late March, the Department of Housing and Urban Development, HUD, announced that it would not require the collection of data on COVID-19 through the Homeless Management Information System. Why is that? 
because they're fucks because they don't because <laughs> they don't want it to look bad right they don't want to have to do anything about this and if they don't have the data to show that it's a problem then they don't have to do yeah. anything so i mean my I, it was a genuine question because i i wonder like were they concerned about you know trying to stay safe and social distance and all that stuff or i don't, I don't know i have no yeah. idea how how they even do their job but yeah <laughs> yeah i mean i i don't know if there would be other reasons besides bowing to the powers that be just an active way to just skew the numbers Mm -hmm. yeah just like everything else with covid in america right now just like yeah okay well if we don't do the testing then we're the least sick people in the plant you know (laughs) right right yeah no that makes so screwed up yeah that agency is meant to collect information about homelessness so it's it's yeah. like you're just well, not mean, doing your job that's why i asked i was like okay yeah. so like do they have a legitimate reason and yeah. if they do i'd like to know you know that's giving them the benefit of the doubt and i appreciate that even though i mean i try <laughs> yeah that's good yeah. <laughs> very i give fair. everybody a chance so yeah faces and all <laughs> <laughs> Okay, because we lack sufficient data to understand the extent of this crisis, its victims have remained largely invisible to the public. Without requiring service providers to gather information on infection and death amongst the homeless population, an effective national response to to address this national health crisis is essentially impossible. The chief executive at the National Health Care for the Homeless Council, Bobby Watts, asserts that government agencies are using, quote, data that suits their political agenda to make the situation look better so it doesn't make them and their government look worse. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. It has, like, <laughs> no interest in even trying to... Sugarcoat it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Nearly half of America's homeless men, women, and children live in only four states, California, New York, Texas, and Florida. The last effort to assess the number of homeless people in America was in 2019, at which point it was concluded that a little more than 560,000 Americans were living without homes. We have to take this figure with a grain of salt, though, as the numbers of homeless individuals is widely considered to be unreported in this country. According to the HUD, the Department of Housing and Urban Development, in 2019, there were 568,000 people living without homes across the country and only 39989 sorry, I can't, I can't word or number. You can't number right <laughs> yeah, now. Yeah, I can't. <laughs> My Numbers. dyslexia is getting the best of me. <laughs> oh, man. Struggle is real. I yeah. feel you on that one. <laughs> No, I mean, so maybe I'll interrupt you with a question, and this uh-huh. might be a dumb question, but whatever. No. Um, so how do you even go about getting a account on uh, the homeless population, right? Like, people can't even fucking fill out their census. Like, Yeah. <laughs> so like, we can't even get, like, an accurate number on, like, individuals living in their homes. But how do we go about mm-hmm. getting a real number on how many individuals are homeless? I mean, you're so on point with asking that question because that is one of the biggest issues here is that number one, they're they're trying to not collect the data. But number two, it's right. it's like inherently difficult to gather data on the homeless when they don't have phones, they don't have insurance, they don't they're not Accurate. in the system, you know. Right. All the places where you would check, you know, statistics mm-hmm. about populations, they're not plugged yeah. into that. So Right. I mean, I was just kind of wondering, like, how how do you go about that yeah. monumental task, you know? And the, they lack the political representation. They lack, mm-hmm. you know, the power to advocate for themselves, too, because they just don't have the resources to do any of that. After you get your needs met, then you can do those kinds of things. Yeah. But if you're just barely making it to the next day, Mm -hmm. that's not available to you. So, yeah, I mean, even before the Trump administration, this is a hard thing. And it's just chronically underreported because... They don't know where they are, really. They, you know, there's. Right. It's probably way fucking more people yeah. throughout the country that are homeless. I feel that's a safe assumption. Yeah, and most people that are like working with the homeless population say that it's hard to track the stuff, and all the figures you see are underrepresenting the actual numbers. So that makes sense. I'm super glad you asked that though, because I think it, it's really important to point that out that this is this yeah. is inherently difficult. Yeah. So according to the HUD, in 2019 there were 500 and 68,000 people living without homes and only 398,549 shelter beds available to them. Oh my God. So that's like half the number that mm-hmm. they need. It was estimated that two thirds of these people were living in shelters with the rest sleeping under bridges or anywhere they could find. 
In cold regions, many of the homeless sleep on steam gates in order to keep alive in the cold winters. God, that's brutal. Yeah. I've heard of friends of mine getting drunk and passing out in different places on the East Coast and having to sleep on steam gates to stay warm at night because they missed the last bus or whatever, you know? Oh, my God. (laughs) But that's not like a, I have to do this every night, and this is my way of survival, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I was shocked that there were so many people in New York City that are homeless because... The climate's got to be so brutal. Yeah. You know, it's, first it's a dark and stormy so, night there. <laughs> yeah, for so long during the year, you know? Mm-hmm. Oh, my God. They barely yeah. catch a break. I mean, and not just cold, the summers. Have you been to New York during summer? Yeah. But- the heat waves, the humidity and the heat. Mm-hmm. And with, you know, climate change, there's going to be more of those extremes. When you're out in the elements, those things make a difference, those extremes. It makes your already horrific life that you're suffering through all the more sufferable. It's just... When I chose the dark and stormy, I was thinking about like, dark and stormy for me is like, bundle up inside. It's atmosphere outside, you know? It's nice. You feel cozy and stuff. The first thing I do is make a hot chocolate. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Exactly. Grab a blanket. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sit by the fire or whatever it is. But, Mm -hmm. you know, if you're out in the elements, you don't have that luxury. And you're just... You don't get to go into your kitchen because you don't have a kitchen. You don't get to turn on your tea kettle because you don't have a tea kettle. Yeah. You don't get to just open your cupboards full of food and grab the box of hot chocolate because you don't have cupboards full of food. Yeah. And they're weathering literal storms, but also like economic storms that are fucking making it so that there aren't actually people outside right now during COVID to beg from. When they used to get a little bit of money here and there from people that were passing by that toss it at them or whatever, they don't have that now. That vanished. Yeah. Yeah. And even with our slow trickle open that we're doing right now, people still aren't going out. Yep. I've been really wanting to do something more for the homeless community. Yeah. You know, the whole whole time this pandemic has been raging, I've just been thinking about them so much. Yeah. I can isolate. I can decontaminate. I can shower. I can do all these things. You know, I can even hire people to go to the store for me so that I don't have to get exposed. Right. Yeah. That's so much privilege compared to what, you know, most people in this country yeah. have to do. Yeah, it's devastating. Absolutely. Because laws against loitering, sleeping in public, and other normal activities for people without homes are often criminalized, these people are frequently circulated back and forth between the street and detention centers, mm-hmm. in and out of prisons. I even heard someone talking about this who who works with homeless populations and saying that it's like we're just moving the pieces around the chessboard, hoping that something's going to get better, but nothing ever will. Just into the homeless shelter, into the prison, into the homeless shelter, into the prison, and you just right. fucking pass them around through these systems, and someone makes a buck off of you, and if, if it's a private prison, you know, like... Yeah, right? Oh, yeah. And there's nothing to break that ugly cycle. We've gotten nothing. Yeah. We could create some really great programs that would just give people homes, get them off the street, and make them productive members of society. Except for they already are productive members oh, of yo, society. God damn it, like, yeah! Like 50% good of point. Them. So, like, fuck, like, yeah. Good point. Uh, yeah. No, but I, I didn't know that fact. I didn't know that 50% of homeless individuals work full-time jobs. Yeah. I did not know that. Yeah. Yeah, they, they said it was between 25 and 50, and lots of places say different numbers, but right. just realizing that, like, even working people are pushed so low economically and drained all the time of their resources and time and money and everything. It's just... yeah. So a recent study conducted by Columbia University predicted that homelessness is likely to increase by 40% by the end of 2020. Mm -hmm. That's probably an understatement. Yeah, fuck yeah. In July, the Household Pulse survey found that nearly 44.5 million Americans were unable to pay their prior month's mortgage or rent payments. Oh my God. 44.5 million people. That's so much. The current count of homeless people is less than a million so like that's crazy Mm -hmm. and shelters are already at capacity streets are at capacity it's like shit they're at capacity and they're being shut down because of covid and and thinned because of covid so it's like you know what are these people supposed to do and they don't want to go to these places because they're so you know like they're hot spots for the Mm -hmm. virus sometimes so yeah they're just trying to survive this virus too yeah I wouldn't want to be in a shelter no. with no barriers between myself and the next person, you know? Yeah. Fuck that. So 
while the CARES Act was providing $600 weekly stipends for those who had lost jobs and income during the pandemic, these stipends expired at the end of July, bringing crippling economic hardship to so many across the country. The CDC has issued another eviction moratorium, allowing many to stay in their homes until the end of the year. But these moratoriums only delay a massive flood of evictions that will leave so many more Americans on the street. Mm -hmm. Experts estimate that between 30 and 40 million Americans are at risk of being evicted in the very near future. Yeah, I mean, the hardest thing is like, okay, like these stipends that have been handed out and these regulations that have been in place to try and keep people in their homes, like these are great measures, but it doesn't give these individuals a job. Yeah. Which is what they need. Yeah. It doesn't give them sustainability in a position, you know, it just... Right. It's a Band-Aid. But I also think it's necessary to, like, actually bail out the little guy, not bail out the fucking big guy. Absolutely. Absolutely. The billions of dollars that we spend on these ginormous companies. Yeah. You know, I, I thought Yang was absolutely ridiculous when he was running, like, the whole, like monthly stipend issue are you kidding i thought that was fantastic really <laughs> that's awesome yeah 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 i really really do Let, i mean let's talk about that yeah why, why do you why did you like that so much um so i see the pros and cons of it i'll go over what i believe are pros first mm -hmm. so it would give everybody just something to work with mm -hmm. right and even if you're already working like the little, so I think it was $1,000 a month is what he was proposing. And I was just thinking, okay, like even if you're working like that $1,000 could be enough to just be that thing that you need that, that you've always needed. Like, man, if I just had another little bit of money, I could finally do this. Mm -hmm. And it, and maybe it's something like I could finally not worry about sending junior to college or yeah. maybe it's I can finally get a car that doesn't break down every time I start yeah. up in the morning to try to yeah. get to my job or maybe it's I can finally you know help my you know pay for my parents health care or something like mm -hmm. that you know so it, it, it could be something like that yeah I'm not super versed in um, a universal basic income yeah but um, I do understand that some of the cons that have been highlighted people think that it would desensitize people yeah totally. and that they would just sit at home and collect their check and not do shit and not contribute and blah yeah. blah blah what's interesting is that in places where they have a universal income that's only been the case in a small percentage yeah so yeah. i know that alaska has a universal bit there's my peppers mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> hey <Yeah>. cayenne <laughs> so alaska has um a form of universal basic income. They don't. I don't know exactly what they call it or what the amount is, but they get a certain amount every month. I think it's. I think it's a smaller amount. I think it's closer to four hundred. Uh -huh. I could be wrong. You know, if you're a citizen, and I've, I'm sorry, uh, Alaskan. I was gonna say yeah. African. <laughs> oh lordy, I'm getting my words wrong. You can't number. I can't word. We're good. <laughs> yeah, why are people even listening to us? <laughs> For the cocktails. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> For the tears. <laughs> yeah, for the tears. Yeah. You jerk. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so I mean, if you look at Alaska, like there's plenty of individuals collecting that every day and they're working their normal jobs and they're just able to have that safety net. It's, it's a safety net. And I think that that's the biggest pro. So yeah, yeah, totally. Tossing it to you, girl. Why are you thinking it's a bad idea? <laughs> Well, I I thought it was just silly and trying to buy votes or something. But then I re then, you know, I learning more about kind of what I was talking about earlier with all the wealth going not even to the 1%, but to the 0.01%. Mhm. Mm and when you have a lot of money, it's so easy to make money. You can sit on your fucking ass and be a total like waste of life, but just send other people off on their on their way to make money for you and fucking keep earning. So the reason that I thought that Yang's proposal was solid as a rock was his mm. big thing is that um, he's concerned about all of the jobs that are going to be lost when mm -hmm. we um, automation when we yeah when automation pretty much just takes over and all of those jobs are gone yeah and I think that that's a really valid fear and concern and we do need to have a plan in place for when that happens because it's going to happen yeah so it's just saying that like oh well they can get another job isn't quite the right solution it's not it's not as easy as that yeah 
So, you know, a universal basic income would help that group and it would help everyone. And uh, I know that's a very oversimplified way of, of <laughs> talking about it, but no, I, think I just, so. I really just kind of think in this case, we're like, you know, every single economic solution is going to come with its pros and cons. I personally just feel that this one comes with more pros than cons. Yeah, totally. And I mean, if we're living in a country where wealth is accumulating into tiny little pockets and you can't get, you know, your foot in the door to even fucking start building that up Mm -hmm. because the whole, the myth of upward mobility that you can just make what you want out of your own hard work and effort. Like Donnie and other people in this story fucking show that that isn't really a reality. Right. Like that's, it's literally a myth that we've passed around because it makes us feel better about the system that we are living in, you know? Right. If you just love the playing fields a little bit, knowing that those people at the bottom, their jobs are always at risk, you know, that that the people at the top, they're always cutting from the bottom and taking all of the profit, you know, hoarding that for themselves, not giving that down, not letting that trickle down to the bottom because, you know, cut, 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 fire people, don't give them insurance, hire people part time because that's cheaper for you. Mm -hmm. That's always going to be the capitalist trend. You you always have to be growing. You always have to be making a profit. And if you always are cutting and taking it for yourself, if you're up at the top, it's going to become unsustainable to the point of like, we can't buy the services that you're selling. The American people can't buy anything, you know, like, because we're just ground down to a fucking pulp. Right. And if we had that money in our pockets, we could buy what the capitalists are selling. We could fucking, you know, pour more money into your coffers, too at the same time as surviving, you know? Yeah. I'm, I'm glad that you're on board with the Yang gang. <laughs> <laughs> I am. I know that about yeah, you. Yeah, <laughs> I'm a Yanger. <laughs> <laughs> a Yanger. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I wasn't going to vote for him. Like, you know, Elizabeth Warren yeah. had my heart. But uh, yeah, I thought it was a great totally. idea. And, and I think that it was, I've been kind of paying attention to that topic a little bit because um, I'm really interested in it. Yeah. And uh, more and more and more people are talking more about it because of covid because of covid totally so uh, there have been a lot of these uh economic and business magazines their blogs and all this stuff Mm -hmm. you know coming out with these articles about a universal basic income Mm -hmm. and uh their big thing is well you know maybe this would have been a good thing to have prior to covid it would have been a a nice space oh my god (laughs) yeah Instead of like praying and hoping that the actual like the CARES Act will actually send you the money that they say that right, they're going to, right. you know, and so many people, even these institutions that are helping the homeless are not getting the money that was set out to help yeah. people. And it's fucking going into the pockets of these rich people, too. It's right. Up. You know, what makes me think, though, is like, how are how would. So say we do implement a universal basic income, which be which would be cool. I'd be like, heck yeah, rad, let's do it. <laughs> right? So say we do it. Um, how would we get that money to homeless people? Good. Like, point. How, wouldn't I you have to have like an address, or wouldn't you have to have like a bank yeah, account? Yeah, yeah. Or you know, like yeah, totally. What's the percentage of homeless individuals that don't even have a bank account? Maybe there's plenty of them that do. Yeah. I, I have no idea, but. Like they could use it the most and they wouldn't have access to it. Oh my so, God. So yeah, that's a big flaw totally. bit. I just found a flaw to yeah. my dreamy little idea over here. But but it's a flaw that could be overcome if you actually had an administration that cared about understanding the problem and cared about intervening and creating yeah. solutions. It's possible. Other countries yes. do it. Well, other countries care about their people. <laughs> that's where it starts. For many who have lost their jobs due to the pandemic, paying the large sum that they will owe after the moratorium ends will leave them on the street. Thus, it is easy to see that the moratorium only hides the impending catastrophe from the public, delaying mass evictions until after the November election. Uh Uh-huh. Good timing there, huh? (laughs) Yeah, just like pass it on to the next Mm -hmm. guy. (laughs) Yeah, so convenient. So to make matters worse... The pandemic has caused many shelters to close their doors or decrease their capacity as dense quarters can easily turn into virus hotspots. In San Francisco, one shelter resident infected 90 people and 10 employees before ever testing positive for the virus. They didn't show any signs of it. Right, that's the gnarly craziness about this virus. Makes it so fucking hard to contain. So understanding this risk, many homeless people across the country have chosen to sleep outside rather than accepting shelter. Another important factor contributing to the severity of the crisis has to do with our enormous prison population. 
Of the more than 2 million prisoners in this country, about 20,000 of these individuals have been freed in an effort to thin the population density in prisons and jails. Even if these individuals had been released into a thriving economy, they would encounter incredible barriers to finding a job as many employers refuse to hire people with criminal records. Instead, they were freed at a time when all but the top 1% are struggling and COVID closures have produced a shortage of jobs. A study by the Texas Criminal Justice Coalition found that former prisoners became homeless at a rate that is 10 times that of other Americans, meaning that many prisoners find themselves in shelters and on the street as soon as they are released. Very little data exists regarding the actual impact COVID-19 has had on homeless people in America. This is largely because testing has been so limited across the country and in the homeless community specifically. A March 2020 study by researchers from UCLA, Boston University, and the University of Pennsylvania predicted that 20,000 homeless individuals could require hospitalization, and 3,400 of these are likely to die from the virus. And that's probably very conservative. Yeah, certainly. Still, many providers of services to these disadvantaged individuals are reluctant to raise the alarm about the risk of virus transmission within and beyond this community, as homelessness already holds so much negative stigma in this country. Dr. Margot Kushel, professor of medicine and director of the Center for Vulnerable Populations at UCSF, provides some insight into the risks of COVID transmission stemming from homelessness. Speaking of the stigma surrounding American homelessness, Dr. Kushel states that we have all been challenged about how we talk about this because homelessness is so stigmatized and people blame homelessness on the victims of homelessness. But let's be real. If we have outbreaks in shelters, if we have outbreaks in encampments, it doesn't matter how well we've prepared everything else. I thought that was a really good quote because it's also it's so thoughtful about how much homeless people deal with this awful stigma. But it's also like, this is a fucking threat that is a public health emergency that needs to be addressed for all of your well-being, right. not just for right. homeless people. So as you probably know or could guess, people of color are disproportionately impacted by both COVID-19 and homelessness. Native Americans, Black people, and Latinx. Latinx is a gender-neutral term for Latinos and Latinas, which I just Oh, you learned. didn't know that? <laughs> I didn't know that. No. <laughs> Get with it, Erica. You're more woke than me. <laughs> <laughs> Barely. <laughs> We're helping each other become more woke every day. Wake up. Latinx, uh, Latinx, I don't even know how to it's say Latinx. it. It's really. mm-hmm. Latinx. Latinx, okay. Account for 65% of America's total homeless population. The Department of Housing and Urban Development has found that black Americans make up 40% of the homeless population across the nation. People of color account for 61% of all reported COVID infections and 50% of all COVID deaths in America. And these numbers are especially shocking when you realize that people of color are only 24% of the population. So 61% of the infections and 50% of deaths, even though they're a quarter of the population. It's a staggering difference. (sighs) It's fucking disgusting and awful. Um, Comparing COVID deaths to population numbers, Latinx have undergone fatalities at a rate that is two and a half times that of white people, and Black Americans have suffered three and a half times the casualties that have occurred amongst white folks. Um, So now I'm going to talk a little bit about the ridiculous national response that we've had during this pandemic. (laughs) Oh, boy. Oh, boy. (laughs) Should I get another drink? (laughs) Yeah. Or a couple. Or two more. (laughs) Yeah. Or a cha 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 triple. <laughs> cha 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 triple. <laughs> Hillary is in these guys. They're they're the best. There's too many of them. <laughs> I say fuck balls all the time. Or balls in my mouth is oh, something no, I say a that lot. One. <laughs> <laughs> Which I got from you when we were in high school. So long ago. <laughs> So I know, good. and it's never left me. I've been saying it my whole life pretty much now. <laughs> so glad that I can impart such an intelligent phrase on you. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a good legacy to leave, you know? <laughs> Balls in my mouth. <laughs> Which is how it sounds when I'm trying to read sometimes. Um, so. <laughs> one of our other friends constantly reminds me of how she got twat waffle from me. And I'm like, oh, that's, that's lovely. <laughs> that's great (laughs) twat waffle i didn't even hear that one that one's awesome (laughs) 
I'm so glad that other people are going to have exposure oh, to your Hillaryisms because uh, I'm like, it's going to sweep the nation. <laughs> Everyone's going to be saying balls in my mouth. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Can you believe that this person has a child? <laughs> <laughs> yep i procreated <laughs> yeah his Lucky his first uh, words are gonna be appreciate you motherfucker <laughs> <laughs> that would be really nice you know mothers need to hear that except for the motherfucker part that's kind of weird a <laughs> <laughs> little bit <laughs> well i appreciate you motherfucker i appreciate you motherfucker <laughs> I'm going to keep plowing ahead so we can get through this, bitch. Do it. (laughs) The government response to the pandemic and its impact on homeless Americans has been absolutely pathetic. In the words of Barbara DiPietro, I don't know how to say that, a policy director on the National Health Care for the Homeless Council, quote, all states have been at a disadvantage in the response to COVID-19 because the federal government has failed to adopt a unified national strategy. In fact, the national strategy seems to be, quote, let states handle it. This is the least efficient, most wasteful way to approach a crisis. Especially since people travel between states. So it's like, okay, like, you know, this individual who has to travel for their job, um, you know, their state is operating in one way and then they travel to another state that's operating in another way. It's like, wait, really? That's that's a shit solution, guys. So frustrating. COVID definitely has made me think like, I wish we had a border around California, but <laughs> but then California started sucking so bad at containing the virus. Yeah. So then I stopped really hoping for that. Yeah, <laughs> totally. But that's a huge problem with like this patchwork response. Mm-hmm. You're going to have these awful patches that were completely horribly mismanaged and they're just a danger to the rest of the population. Mm-hmm. Everyone else. Yeah. Good job there, guys. Fucking America. <laughs> Super proud. Mark Dons, the executive director at a public policy organization focused on racial equality called the National Innovation Service, stated that, quote, we have been left county by county, city by city to cobble together a public health response to something that is on par with the Spanish flu in terms of its infectiousness and potential lethality. To simply step out of this role, to step out of the responsibility in this moment feels like a fundamental abdication of the purpose of government. Which it fucking is. Mm-hmm. Like, if you're not there to take care of your people, what are you doing? Yeah. And you're most vulnerable. Like, Well, but I mean, we should have known that, that this is how Trump was going to handle it. I mean, mm-hmm. we knew from day one he was in office for his own good, to better himself, to line his pockets thicker yeah. and thicker. Yeah. Something like this happening? No, he's just going to take care of himself. Yeah. Not, not the American people. And the bailouts, you know, the COVID support that's going to his cronies and to people that are wealthy in the administration, like, go fuck yourself. If you're going to offer help, but it's going to be just to make the rich richer that are in your circle, Mm -hmm. go fuck yourself. Under the Trump administration, speaking of which, the federal response to helping the homeless who are so vulnerable in the face of the virus has been completely backwards. While the CARES Act allocated $4 billion to help the homeless, the vast majority of these funds never made it to communities in need of support. Whoa, how? Well, so in early August, the Howard Center for Investigative Journalism found that at least a third, less than a third of this funding had actually been distributed to the organizations that help the homeless across the country. I mean, I don't even know how I'm surprised. Like, there were so many individuals, non-homeless individuals, yeah, they, they never even got their check. So it's like, okay, cool. Yeah. It's like they, they want to, like, have the policy to look good, but then they don't actually want to enact it. And if you actually want to get the benefits of that yeah. policy, you have to fight tooth and nail, call calling all the right people and and just being relentless to try to get the support that is supposedly there for you to help you. So the current administration has even worked to unravel a policy adopted by the George W. Bush administration in 2004, a policy named Housing First, that worked to house the homeless as the primary step towards creating environments in which addiction and mental health issues can be more easily treated. The U.S. Interagency Council on Homelessness coordinates the federal government's efforts to combat the spread of COVID amongst Americans who are living without homes. Its executive director, Robert Marbut, M-A-R-B-U-T, has prioritized a political agenda while advocating for policies that prevent the homeless from accessing services. 
So he's in charge of fucking, you know, helping these people. And he's he's creating policies that are barriers to that. That's horrific. Marbot has pushed to require homeless people to meet benchmarks like passing drug tests and participating in counseling and job training in order to qualify for housing support. Marbot's council claims that there have only been 130 COVID deaths amongst the homeless, but the Howard Center for Investigative Journalism easily proved that the actual numbers are far surpassed this figure as they counted more than 150 deaths in just six wow. cities. So these people are full of fucking shit. <laughs> yeah. Um, in California, Project Room Key has worked to relocate homeless individuals from outdoor encampments and crowded shelters to isolated settings like hotel rooms. With support from the state and emergency funds from the federal government, more than 14,000 people were moved into secure, isolated settings in California by June 30th. Still, Marbot and the U.S. Interagency Council on Homelessness has spoken out against the use of hotels to provide socially distanced shelters. This is in spite of the fact that three of his predecessors, who filled the same role, argue that the use of hotels and motels is critical and an effective strategy for saving lives right now. Yeah, it's absolutely effective. I mean, what what was his reason? Did he even give a reason why he didn't think that was a good idea? I mean, these hotels aren't being used anyways. Yeah, exactly. Like, you're even giving money to these hotel owners. Yes. So why is it? But he's he's saying, that, oh, you know, the effective thing to do would be to put them in shelters. The shelters are at capacity. And we have other buildings that aren't being used. Yeah. We, have, we have roofs yeah. that are not being used. And and the shelters don't isolate people. They become hot spots. Right. You're in shared rooms, shared spaces. You know, in a hotel, you have your own bathroom. You have your own bed. You know, you're able to isolate and do the things that the government has ordered you to fucking do. Yes. You can't do that in a shelter. You can't do that on the street. It's a perfect solution that these fucks are like, nope. I don't think so. I don't. It doesn't show that it's working. I wonder what the moneyed interests are that are dictating yeah, that. Yeah, you know? I would be curious to dig more into that because that just doesn't make any sense yeah. to me. Yeah. And like, what a like this just shows his true idiocracy. Like that would be like the easiest way to like. He's kind of an idiot for not realizing this like easy like hero moment that he could have grabbed on to <laughs> like he could have been like oh yeah let's use all these hotels and blah 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 and then just touted like that that was his idea because uh it was his job so like i mean yeah yeah what a, what an totally. idiot for not just doing it because it makes him look good like come on yeah. dummy yeah <laughs> Seriously, if you want to leave a positive legacy in your life, like you've got the opportunity here. You're in the role to do something fucking fantastic that could make the plight of the homeless in America so much better over over the long term. Right. Like realizing that homelessness is a public crisis and trying to fix that is something that's going to improve the well-being of the whole country, not just these people. Like that's... Right. He could have been a hero. He could have had that hero moment in so many ways, yeah. but he just squandered it as a fucking asshole loyalist. Well, it's just short sighted. You know? I mean, when when all you're thinking about is yourself, you don't you don't think about you know how like even something like that could benefit you. You know, it's just that yeah. short sightedness. Yeah. I mean, it's shitty even fucking think like that. But like, I just I don't know. I saw that as a missed opportunity for him to be. You know. No, I didn't think of it like that, but you're totally right. If I was in this role, I would make myself a fucking hero. Totally. You know? <laughs> I mean, yeah, that seems like dirty fucking thinking, but whatever. I think you're right, though. I mean, be selfish in a way that is positive. Yeah, you know? There we go. <laughs> <laughs> if you're going to be a dirt bag, be a dirt bag in a way that benefits others. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> That's hilarious. PSA for the evening. <laughs> Very true. <laughs> So I'm I'm so close here. Are you? I am. Oh. <laughs> I can cut that. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. That was rude. It's so close. It's so rude. <laughs> so rude, Hillary. Oh my god. <laughs> I kind of don't want to cut that out. I think you should. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I probably should. Yeah. Okay. You probably should. Definitely gonna. It doesn't add to the story. <laughs> It adds to the fun. <laughs> <laughs> it's a 
crucial part of the story. Okay. This depressing fucking story. Yeah. God, I know. You're the worst. I know. I'm so sorry. I don't want to do this podcast anymore. I cry too much. God damn it. Oh, no. Okay, I'm, I'm going to need to do a positive one for the next you one. You ruined it. Oh, no. Oh, I'm no. just a sad sack now. No. <laughs> I just start going to therapy for my podcast. Oh, no. <laughs> That's what the My Favorite Murder Girls had to do. Too much murder, but they... Uh, Damn, are you serious? Well, they were already going to therapy, but they talk about murder a lot in therapy, so... <laughs> <laughs> All right, back on topic. I have a screaming baby downstairs. <laughs> All right. So we're talking about the U.S. Interagency Council on Homelessness. Many accuse the agency of pursuing a loyalist political agenda rather than actually working to gather data and provide solutions to this national crisis. Citing a report from this agency, senior policy advisor Policy Webster of the Department of Housing and Urban Development stated that the low death and infection numbers that have been reported for the homeless in America, quote, mitigate against the rush to house PEH, which is people experiencing homelessness, in non-congregate shelters such as hotels and motels. So he's saying, we don't need to do that. Uh, He even stated that converting hotels and motels into shelters for the homeless had, quote, nothing to do with COVID and everything to do with the inability of communities to develop permanent housing for their homeless, and especially in high rent regions. Clearly, the HUD and the Interagency Council on Homelessness are more interested in passing the buck and blaming states rather than providing any sort of national strategy for helping those most vulnerable who are left out in the cold during a deadly pandemic. So I just wanted to close with a little quote from Donnie from my conversations with him, because I felt like that was just so illuminating for me. Yeah, certainly. So he says, I'm grateful for the warm bed and full time job that I have. For others who are experiencing homelessness, you're not alone. Other people have the same worries you do, like where is my next meal coming from? Where am I sleeping tonight? And will I be safe? For those of us about to be homeless, I would set goals and find out all the resources out there in your community. Find someone in the community or a loved one to check in with you. You got this and it's temporary. Stay strong. There are people who care out there and you're not alone. Oh, what a badass sweetheart. Yeah, that gets me a little oh, choked up. Oh, my just goodness. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <sighs> I don't know. I was so happy that I got to talk with him and actually like... Yeah, thank you for sharing your story. Yeah, thank you, Donnie. You're you're brave for doing that. You're putting yourself out there. It it can't be a hundred percent comfortable, but you you are a hero for doing that at a time when so many people are on the edge of what you've gone through. Yeah, we appreciate you. Yeah, we appreciate you so much. And all the other people out there who are just living on the edge. Like we're thinking about you. We're worried about you. You're not alone. And and create a plan for what comes next, just like Donnie says. Like, look, write down those numbers, write down those resources before you're homeless, so that you have recourse once you are on the street. And never, never, never give up. Yeah, never give up. Don't fucking give up. Donnie didn't do it. <laughs> no, he didn't. He didn't. Yeah, fucking hero. <laughs> he is. So that's that's all. That's all I got. <laughs> that was another doozy, Erica. But um, no, a, a something, a, a topic that I'm actually really happy that you that you chose and that you, we did this episode on because I do think a lot about it, and I know that a lot of other people think a lot about it too. Yeah, you know, it, it's just outside our door. Yeah, and it's it's really awful. And so many more people are going to be thinking about it than have ever had to think about it before. The thirty to forty million people that are at risk of being evicted that's you know more than 40 times as many homeless people as exist already so don't feel like it's just you because it isn't Mm -mm. this is america (laughs) (laughs) all right babe well i i feel like i should let you go back to your family you got your boy screaming back there Let's do it, yeah. I'm sure everybody could hear the the hollering babe in the back. <laughs> but yeah. Can you give a, our closing remarks? Um, yeah, certainly. <laughs> There's no wealth but life. Truly. See you people later. Hasta luego. <laughs>